Hey, everybody. Thanks for making it to this cluster. We're calling this cluster. I've forgotten. Where am I? Uh, where are we? Thursday, right? Yes. The Pandemic Law School. We have three sets of presenters. And, and may I say so far, the, the fact that, we're, that we've uh, constrained presenters into 15 minutes seems to be working out pretty good. Um, um, so you, 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 have, you, have a, you have a tradition to uphold here. We have pestilence, fire, flo and floods, Kent during COVID. Deb Ginsburg uh, will be speaking. Um, and I see that Sagel is also here. Uh, and followed by that will be Colorado's Colorado Laws virtual Zoom rooms. Jonathan Sibre, uh, the IT director, Teresa uh, Coberly uh, uh, speaking. And then uh, the last one will be the before times versus the after plague. Mad Max Beyond, Zoomadrome, sex solos are highly encouraged with Miguel, <laughs> Miguel Bordo, Deb Kinney, and Jeff Chilcott at, from Duke Law. So with that, uh, Deb Ginsburg, take it away. Okay, hold on. I'm like moving things around. Um, I've got to get my screens absolutely perfect. How's this gonna work? All right, so start screen. All right, so hit start screen, and it's got other things to do. Very slowly, it's letting me pick. The screen. Which one would you like? Don't worry. This take your time, one, please. The good thing about being online is there's other people who could like uh, fill fill the space while you uh, while while we wait for the screen to share. There we go. All right. You see something? What? We see a message that says Deborah Ginsburg has started screen sharing. And what's being shared? Uh, right now, it's just a black screen with that message in the middle of it. That's great. And now we see a giant COVID, and now we see a thank you for attending CaliCon. See you next year. Ah. I will not go to the beginning. Do you see a pestilence, fire, and floods? There we go. Now we see pestilence, fire, and floods. Okay. Um, I may be speaking faster than they think. Hi. Wow. Um, so it's been a really amazing year. All right, so uh, we're come here to talk about what we did during the time of pestilence, fire, uh, fire and floods. By the way, we're just going to the end of last week. Um, that's why we ended floods. Um, and we're gonna talk about what Chicago Kent did, uh, particularly from the tech side during COVID-19. Uh, as you guys probably remember, you were supposed to be here on our campus, enjoying the 87 degree weather. Uh, it looks like that's happening next year. And instead, now we're all virtual and we're happy to see each other this way. Um, and we went virtual because of this guy here, um, SARS-CoV-2 or whatever he wants to call. As he said, you must all social distance and therefore we have to present virtually. We can't uh, do all the exciting things we wanted to do at Chicago Kent this year, next year for sure. And instead, uh, we were given a week to move from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, some of the things that we did, some of the things that went right, some of the things we are reconsidering, uh, what we might be considering from the future, um, and answer your questions at the end. This is our tech team. It is not the only team. You'll see me drop all kinds of names into this because this has been truly a group effort from pretty much everyone in the law school. But these are the people who are handling the tech and this is the tech conference. So let's talk about Sejal Vaishnav. She is the director of IT and AV. She is the person who is getting things done all the time. It may be coming up with strategic directions. It may be rewiring a server. We just don't know what she's gonna do next. While she is head of AV, the day-to-day -day, uh, operations for AV fall on Sue Jaden. Sue Jaden gets so many other hats besides. I'll be talking about some of them as I go through. We've got Emily Barney, the technology training and marketing develop, uh, librarian. And this particular set of circumstances has made her use all of her skills uh, as she's come up with cheat sheet after cheat sheet. Uh, it's just been amazing what she's done. And I'm Debbie Ginsberg, educational technology librarian. I made videos. I did stuff. 
we are doing all of this work to help faculty move, to help them and students move and staff move and help all of them continue to do their work working remotely as is everybody else. I'm here, I'm in Oak Park, uh, Illinois. You'll hear me mention that a few times. Chicago Kent is, would be down the street by about 10 miles, which means in Chicago, that's an hour commute. No, I'm not exaggerating. Emily lives a little northwest of me, uh, Sagel to the, uh, or northeast of me, Sagel to the west. And those dotted lines uh, indicating Indiana, that's where Sue is. So we are within a few hundred square miles and yet we're all working together every day. Uh, what have we been doing since the beginning? We have been strategizing, planning, creating checklists, creating training materials, cheat sheets, and all kinds of other things to help everybody make the transition and keep the transition going. And when we don't know what we're doing, we improvise. We have all kinds of tools that we use to help us with this. Google Chat is one of our most popular tools. We're on there all day, passing information back and forth. Uh, sometimes we'll just get onto a Google Hangout and have a quick discussion. We have daily meetings with uh, us and some other members of the COVID team on Zoom, and we make extensive use of Google Drive. We have a special Google Drive set up just for the COVID-19 response, where we can gather lots of information and make sure it's there for this project and other projects going forward. It's hard to think about where we've been in, uh, and where we are now. It seems like last year, no wait, just at the end of February, that we were presenting at the ABA Tech Show and uh, a lot of you were there. Uh, there wasn't much social distancing. Emily was quarantining herself because she had the flu, so she was being socially responsible. So she was at home, um, but you know that's what we thought we were dealing with, flu season. We didn't really know it was coming up next until the following week when we started to see more meetings appear on our calendars about preparing for COVID. We weren't really sure what we were preparing for. Maybe we were preparing for um, some people not being there and we had to be able to support them. Maybe it was going to be a full quarantine. We weren't sure, so we started to think about different scenarios. Uh, many people were involved with this planning, so pictures here you see Dean Krug, the Dean of the Law School, Steve Soule, Dean of Students, uh, Jenna Abjit, the Head of Student Services, you've met Sage already, Jean Wenger is the Director of the Library, there's me, not here, people like Don Rubsich, who is the Head of Everything, but particularly the Head of Building and Finances, Ariana Monroe, who works with Finances, all of us, Admissions, Clerk services, all of us are working together to figure out what are some of the possibilities in, in coming up with, with different strategies. Um, the library, of course, itself had a meeting. You've seen already in different presentations what different libraries have done. So we have our own meeting. These are our librarians. There's Jean, there's me, there's Emily, there's Eric, the head of access services, and Mandy, our research librarian, as we try to figure out what students are going to need and how to get them access to it. Uh, and that also fits in with some of the technologies because certain things uh, like Bloomberg uh, needed uh, additional um, information pushouts in order to get that information to students. So we're all working together to do this. We are thinking in that first week, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be recording all of the classrooms, which is not something we normally do. And we're going to put them all in Panopto. And we're thinking, okay, we've got these great classrooms, but maybe some of these students that you see here aren't going to be able to make it. Or maybe Kari Johnson is teaching this great class. Maybe she'll be sick and she can't make it. So we want to set up the classes so they can record. We don't have that set up automatically, but we have some equipment like these great Yeti mics. And we're going to put them into our classrooms and get them uh, available so we are able to record. And that's something we were able to set up. Um, turns out this is going to be helpful to us later because we didn't know that all of these plans were going to be stopped in their tracks and we were going to, within just a few days, receive this email from uh, the head of the school saying, effective at 5 p.m. Friday, March 21st, everything was going to be shut down and we were going to be a stay-at-home order and we were not going to be allowed to come back to work unless we were essential. Talk about that in a second. How did we get there? If you are following the stories, you know, it's many, true in many states, Illinois had its particular epicenterness. It wasn't New York, but it certainly did a lot. Uh, within days after the ABA Tech Show, we're starting to see large conferences be canceled. That's kind of odd. About a week later, more things are happening and universities are starting to say, um, we're not gonna have in-person classes, the bigger ones. But we're, those of us in smaller are like, we're not sure what's gonna happen with us yet. We're, we weren't clear. On March 12th, 
not pictured here, Oak Park canceled its school uh, through the beginning of April. And so now I'm home. And on March 13th, all public and private K through 12s were closed. So we're starting to see, hmm, the K through 12s are closed, but they have different needs. They don't have people on campus the same way. Most of them don't. So what are we going to do here in our environment? We start to think about, okay, prepare for classes. And now we've really got to prepare for the shutdown. Um, we've got the uh, CPS is going to close. They close through April. That's going to affect many of our workers. Oak Park, where I live, has started its own shelter in place order. So I can't, I'm not coming to work. I couldn't come if I tried. And then on the 20th, we've got the full stay at home order, which means for sure, as of the 21st, we are all staying at home. So now we have to prepare. We have that whole week coming. We have a whole week to prepare. What did we do? Unfortunately, that was spring break week, which means that faculty and students generally weren't around and certainly there weren't classes in place that gave us more time. Not a lot, but more. So we used the time as much as we could. What did we do? Um, we had been meeting in the Dean's conference room, so those who are still coming to work, you can see a couple of us were at home because of, uh, our children were at home, started to, to meet in classrooms and practice social distancing as we prepared. We were still having these meetings. They are on Zoom now. Um, I started to compare a lot of videos. I, their videos are not ideal, but they are a quick and dirty way to get information out um, about how systems work. Videos for some of the stuff are already available, but they didn't explain the Chicago Kent system, so we wanted to make sure that happened. And also started comparing, uh, compiling Google Docs to help uh, faculty walk themselves through different processes uh, as they got themselves ready. So we had these things ready to go uh, by the end of the week. In addition, our IT staff, and our IT staff have been inundated. They had just finished updating all of our computers and a com complete computer refresh for most of the school so we could run Windows 10 effectively. Plus, they are working on a VoIP project. And now they thought they had some time to make sure remote access was fully set up the way they wanted to. They had days. And they got it up because our faculty and students and staff, are, or faculty and staff, not students, were going to need access to their information on their computers. And so that they got up. So the end of the week. The other thing that was needed by the end of this week was we knew um, a lot of faculty and students and staff may not have good internet access at home. We had some hot spots. We made sure they were available, particularly to students. They were distributed to students before uh, there was a chance, uh, before everything shut down. So they had a chance to come and get the hot spots. So um, we knew a little bit about what faculty needed in terms of um, if they're set up, particularly the full-time faculty, and we were working with them. Uh, students have a laptop requirement. A lot of them are prepared. Then we had to figure out, okay, what about staff? Because they can be all over the place. Some staff have setups like mine. So here you can see I've got my three-year-old laptop, a monitor I stole for my son, my iPad that I use as a sidecar. I've got my Yeti mic. I've got everything set up here, and it's all fun. Um, some people like Emily took stuff home, so Emily took home her computer and laptop. She got her keyboard and mouse. She also grabbed my keyboard and mouse because I forgot it, an extra monitor. That's her surface. She grabbed the library iPad. You may notice she's working in cramped conditions. Uh, she's sort of working in a really tiny bedroom here um, because of an issue that I will address later in the presentation. But uh, yeah, it's a little bit cramped for her, but she's got all her stuff. But not everybody had all this stuff available particularly in the library. So Emily made sure the library was all set up. We had extra computers. She made sure everybody had the computer equipment they needed. They, there was a bunch of different uh, computers in the library. Some are um, people's workstations, some are general workstations. She made sure they had VPN access. She got that all taken care of. So when the library staff went home, they were going to be able to work. Why? Because oh, also in the middle of this, we're in the midst of a catalog upgrade, and there is a lot of library work to be done. So they've got that going on. Uh, she also uh, went in at the end of that week and even at the beginning of next week to make sure that extra AV equipment was gathered and made available to any faculty who needed it through AV. So she gathered extra mics, uh, webcams, and um, speakers and made sure that they were available. Uh, she was safe. She did wear her gloves. She's not wearing a mask here because she's by herself. She, does, she sews her own masks, so I know she's got plenty of them. So she is keeping herself safe. She did, did have to go in uh, once or twice as an essential worker to make sure people had what they needed. And then we could all be working from home, which is what we did. Hmm. 
after Emily. I know there's not a blank screen. I've done this six times. Ah, so there we go. no, that's part of it, but not the right part. So we started preparing the, uh, the faculty at that point. It's the first week back and we're starting to prepare the faculty to teach. And what should be here uh, is my picture of a Google Meet. We are Google Ads for Education. We have Google Meets and Google Meets is fine. It's got lots of different great things. It's got ways to record. You can add to it from your Google Calendar. Um, it's even got more or less okay captions, um, but it wasn't Zoom. And what our faculty wanted was Zoom because that's what they saw everyone else using and there's a lot of great features that Zoom has. So what happened? Well, we got Sagel and within about a day, we had Zoom for Chicago Kent set up for our faculty and had relatively happy faculty with Zoom. Uh, it's been quite a useful tool for us. Uh, which then of course meant we had to pivot and start planning all the Zoom stuff. So Emily had started preparing cheat sheets. Zidios are a great way to get started. They can show the overall ideas of how a process works, but sometimes it's hard to pick up the step-by-step. -step. Cheat sheets can pick up those step-by-step -step things and Emily started working on those. Dozens. So here's some of the ones for Zoom. Um, we also were concentrating on asynchronous teaching too. Anything that got recorded, we wanted to be put in Pinocto and some people were just making videos anyway that were available in Pinocto. Because we were already prepared to teach, um, we, um, if we were in the classroom, we had folders available for everybody. And we just had to show the, the faculty, okay, once you make your video one place, here's how you put it into Pinocto so it's available for the students. So we wanted it available for students because some students couldn't attend synchronously. For example, you have one t uh, student in Germany and some classes just met at a time, like three in the morning that they just couldn't attend. All right, we got through that first week, okay, everything's going all right, and now it's start to sort of refine things. We spent April refining what we were doing and also thinking about the summer. So we started concentrating on making sure everybody integrated and understood the main tools available, Zoom for live sessions, Google Calendar for scheduling, Panopto for uh, presenting and storing recordings, Twin is what we use for doc uh, sharing documents and materials. We talked a little bit about teaching strategies too. They had been teaching face-to-face, -face, they moved to teaching online, there is a bit of a transition there. Um, and so you've heard of other sessions talk about it, so we, we talked about that too. Some faculty, particularly adjuncts, need a hand-holding. Our full-time faculty tend to sort of be aware, at least of general, what's available to them. They're in our system. Adjuncts may have been working with stuff from their office that may not be available to them now that they're at home. So they needed a little more hand-holding. Fortunately, we had something called Bongar that let our IT people go in and see what was wrong. Was it the computer? Was it something specific to their system that uh, went against our directions? Did they just not read or understand our directions. All of this is something we could learn from. And again, Sajal and her team uh, made sure that when people needed the handholding, they could go in with Bongard, now known as Beyond Trust, to make sure things were going okay. People remained at Chicago Kent College of Law. Sue Jaden, the head, uh, person from AB, is one of them. She's also the head of the mail room, so we have equipment coming in that needs to go out to other people. Occasionally, we had someone to say, I can't get to my computer through VPN. Can you make sure it's okay? She would handle that kind of thing. She's the one who held down the fort and continues to hold down the fort while the rest of us are working from home, and it's been a really amazing help. But one of the greatest heroes of this entire uh, crisis has been Sajel. She has held everything together. She has the vision. She goes in and makes things work. She holds us all together. She makes sure faculty have what they need, staff have what they need, students have what they need. She is on top of everything. There is no way we could be as successful as we have been, and I think it's pretty successful, without her vision, perseverance, uh, intelligence, whatever great word you want to put there, it applies to Sajel, the hero of Chicago Kent. Because not only did she have to deal with everything else, oh yes, there was a fire. Uh, there was a bit of equipment from ComEd that went on fire, knocked out some of our systems for the better part of a day. Uh, mo most of what we do is Google Apps for Education, but things like Panopto, we log in with a local uh, center. This happened, of course, around exams, while also while we were preparing for the summer. But Sajal and her staff got it up running very quickly. I said we're preparing for summer, and so we started concentrating on who's teaching for summer and what we're, they're going to need. And what we did is, again, started preparing more cheat sheets, and we started simplifying them. Harvard has a great way of doing cheat sheets. 
that it'll be simple, puts things uh, in a really visually easy to read uh, format. And so we started converting some of our cheat sheets, which are good already, into this format. And that's really made life easier. Faculty like to print things out. So um, that's been pretty popular. And then for the summer, uh, people who are teaching the summer, we did mandatory boot camps where we said, here is how you're going to use Zoom to connect your classes. Here is how you're going to use Google Calendar to let your students know about Zoom. Here is how to get the stuff from Zoom to, uh, uh, once the stuff is in Zoom, into the right place, into Monopto so students can see it. Here are the things you can do with Twin to communicate and uh, talk to your students. And also, this is all online. So here's some additional teaching strategies. You've heard them in other sessions, like additional assessment that can help you work. And if that's not enough, while we're getting ready, there's a flood. Nine inches of rainfall in Chicago, Lori Lightfoot needs to reverse the Chicago River and it winds up in basements like the Sears slash Willis Tower, which went dark, or my basement and Emily's basement. My basement was okay. I don't live there, it was annoying, but it certainly required a little good cleanup. I think I just finished the stuff, last, most of it last week. Emily had already had a flood in her living space in October. She had almost finished cleaning it up. That's why she was in that tiny room upstairs when suddenly she had more to clean up. My understanding is she's complete, uh, it's pretty much cleaned up. She can be back in her own space now, finally, after eight months. It has been quite a time. But we continue to go on despite the pestilence, fire, and flood. And we are getting ready for the fall year. We think, hopefully we can do some social distancing at school, but a lot more is gonna be online. So what do we need to know? Well, let's see what Callie has to tell us in the online course that starts next week. A few hundred have already signed up. What's a few hundred more? Sign up and enjoy. We're gonna to continue to prepare, particularly for faculty agents to start, not forgetting our staff and students, by doing more training and more planning. We have weeks to plan now, not just days. So let's use that to see what can be some of the best options we can provide to our faculty, as well as our students and staff, um, going forward in terms of what technologies are available, what training's available, and how that all fits within their teaching, learning, and working. We'll continue to work together. This is a team that's worked together for a long time. If you look at an earlier presentation I did at Cali some time back, I'll tell you how we all work together to get Panopto, and we'll continue to work together to make things work for the fall. Of course, we can't work without the rest of our team. We've got faculty support, Rose and Nicole. They've been doing things on Twin and Panopto just to make sure they work. Rudy and Juan from IT um, have been helping Sajel make sure everything works from day to day and not to, uh, besides many others I can't even think of to uh, mention. And we're hoping to have a successful fall, hoping to have something to talk to you about next year here at Chicago Kent, here in Chicago in 2021, and we hope to see you there. Awesome, awesome team effort, Deb. Great, let's move on to our second presenters, Colorado Laws Virtual Zoom Rooms. Jonathan, Teresa, the floor is yours. Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you all are doing well and that you're staying healthy and that uh, you're surviving this craziness. I uh, wish we were with you all in, in Chicago there, Debbie. Uh, so today we're going to do a quick overview of our, our Zoom rooms here at Colorado Law. Uh, so first of all, to introduce uh, your hosts, I'll let uh, Teresa go first. That would be host as opposed to attendee. <laughs> I'm Teresa Coberly. I'm the IT support manager at the um, University of Colorado Law School. Um, currently working from the Longmont, Colorado remote office. And I'm John Sabra. I'm the IT director at, at Colorado Law. So coming up, we're going to do a quick look at uh, why Zoom, the same challenge that you all faced, uh, our solution, a couple of unique twists that uh, you may find helpful, what worked for us, what didn't, and then what we're doing in the future. And then it looks like questions will come up uh, here at the end and we'll be happy to answer those. So, you know, I think everybody is probably familiar with Zoom at this point. If you haven't heard of it, you probably just walked out of a cave somewhere in a remote region, but it's, you know, very similar to, to WebEx, GoToMeeting, BlueJeans, you know, y'all are familiar with those tools. But I really think the, the powerful piece of Zoom is really its ease of use. And then uh, the founder of Zoom, Eric Wan from, uh, formerly of Cisco's WebEx, he really saw that the, the key part of video conferencing was really reducing that latency. And so his vision for Zoom was to really have that latency reduced to the minimal amount possible to really encourage natural conversation. And at Colorado, we've been using Zoom, I wanna say five to seven years now. So we've been bringing in guest speakers, 
and hosting some conferences and webinars with it, but it hadn't been in, in really widespread use. So I'm not sure our faculty or students are really familiar with it until uh, this last March. Uh, but we've, we've had some familiarity with Zoom before this. So the same challenge that, that you all have faced, you know, the dumpster fire that uh, spring of 2020 was, uh, but we were really faced with, you know, how do we offer a remote option for students and kind of in two scenarios, the first, which was, you know, with live classes and then later when everything shut down, you know, how do we go fully remote? And really the challenge for us was, you know, faculty and students are just really inexperienced with video conferencing and technology. We didn't really have a strong learning management system support place. Like our courses, we had some twin courses, but for the most part, there was no online home uh, for most of our classes. So the solution uh, for us was really what we branded Zoom Rooms. Now, I want to be clear, this is not the extra expensive Zoom licensed Zoom room where you have a hardware codec uh, that connects a classroom or a conference room directly into Zoom. But we really branded it this idea of just it's your classroom and it's a, a virtual extension of that physical classroom. And we really chose Zoom early on because of the ease of entry. And now obviously there's secure security concerns around that and I'll touch on that later. But it's really, we have this like, we just got to get them into the room. That was our motto. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we were familiar with it from guest speakers and conferences. So the way we configured Zoom was we set up an account for each one of our physical classrooms. So if we've got, you know, Wolf Law Room 204, physical room, there was a Zoom room, you know, named 204 as well. And in each of these accounts, we configured uh, the Zoom meeting with no end date. So it's just a recurring Zoom uh, that, that's just ongoing perpetually. And it's that extension of the physical room. And we really try to market and push this that it counts this way for scheduling, with the idea being that when we were live and we had some students who were either risk or who were potentially sick remote, they would just jump into that physical or virtual counterpart of the physical room. And then we asked our faculty and students to use uh, their CU personal Zoom rooms for office hours and for meetings. So if they wanted to schedule you know, a, a meetup or you know, a lecture, they would just use our room scheduling system in my law to make that happen. So why did we not let faculty uh, create their own Zoom rooms, because many of our adjuncts and some faculty who were familiar with Zoom wanted to do this. But really, from our point of view, it was about standardization and consistency for students. That was a really important point. We wanted them to just know, you know this is where you go, because there's not a really strong communication system when courses go online. Uh, and the other piece of it is we really wanted to retain that admin control. We wanted to be able to help secure the rooms, configure the settings, and then be able to pull recordings and help faculty and students if they ran into trouble uh, during class. So that's, that's, I think, the basics of how we configured our rooms. And Teresa, I don't know if I've missed anyone. Feel free to jump in. Yeah. Well, I think you've, you've got that. So essentially, John had asked our IT department for a separate Zoom license for each classroom. Correct, yeah. Thank you, Teresa, for pointing that out. So the, the thing that I think made our Zoom rooms stand out was this idea of putting a short link in front of each one of these persistent meetings. So as you all are familiar, you get this, you know, whatever your Zoom domain is, dot zoom dot us slash meeting ID, you know, whether it's a J or whether it's a webinar or a meeting. And those were somewhat confusing uh, that we found before when we were running conferences and bringing in guest speakers. So we've got a dot law domain and we have a URL redirect tool uh, in front of that. There's a, a WordPress plugin called URL Shortener by My Theme Shop. Now, while it may sound not completely legit, we've been using this for no, a number of years and it's proven to be reliable. Uh, but the idea was that we would set up that virtual extension at our URL redirect. So colorado.law slash wolf204 was corresponding with room204. And we published this widely and students could just type this into their browser and immediately be joined into Zoom. And it's even more important is that's the same for our faculty. They would just go to that room. So we could tell them instead of walking in the door, just go to this link to that room. 
So the, the other challenge we faced was how do you give host features? Because you know, anybody can join an open Zoom meeting, but if you want to mute participants or you want to leverage breakout rooms or polling, you really need to have, uh, you, know, you need to be a meeting host. So what we did uh, was a couple of different things and this iterated, uh, but initially we would share a host claim code with our faculty so they could go to the participants panel and then claim host for their meeting. And then later it, it occurred to us we can hack into the way that the Zoom links work and use another URL redirect for faculty. So in this case, we could set up colorado.law slash wolf204 dash claim host. And that would prompt faculty to log in. We have already granted their account access inside of that Zoom account. And they could just log in and, and have those host rights that are, are so important to teaching. So again, you know, we're, we're moving along through the semester. I'm definitely biting my nails, hoping this thing holds together. We've got uh, you know, these host only features figured out. We added meeting passwords later. And that was, you know, as Zoom bombings, you know, obviously a, a big concern. Most Zoom bombings are from people publicly posting Zoom join links to open meetings on Twitter. Uh, several professors on our C Boulder campus, not on the law school, thankfully, but on the main campus, you know, they put it out via a tweet or they'd post it on a public facing web page. And so those Zoom meetings got bombed. Uh, but during this time, there were uh, brute force tools and there were you know, things coming out around that allowed random Zoom bombings to open meetings. So we implemented a password into our meetings later on. And again, we just encouraged faculty and staff to protect that short link. Don't share that publicly so that you don't get bombed. Because it's really like posting your uh, phone number you know, via Twitter and then blaming AT&T. You know, why am I getting all these, these crank calls? It's not necessarily AT&T's fault. Um, and I think the media gave Zoom a hard time for that. Perhaps, I think somewhat unfairly, you know, Zoom's claim to fame was really the idea of ease of joining a meeting. And it's not necessarily their fault that they made it so easy that people just posted it everywhere to join the meeting. Um, and then with our, our clinical classes, we had concerns about encryption. Um, Zoom advertised end-to-end -end encryption, which is not the case. It was encrypted in, in transit, but Zoom themselves had access to those keys and be able to access those conversations. But we really you know, followed this open classroom model and really told faculty, you know, the door to your classroom is also open. So you know, if someone comes in, it, it's got to be a semi-public place. We want to try to limit who can access, but it does need to be a public space. So, you know, looking back from this point of, you know, this crazy fast semester, you know, what worked for us is really, I, th I think we early on, we had this dystopian vision. Um, I'm a bit of a germaphobe, so I've been following the you know, pandemic as it developed out of China. And by early mid-February, I was talking to our administration that we may have to do something. I'm like, John, you're nuts. This is not, it's not any worse than the flu. You know, we're we're going to be okay. And I, I wish that would have been the case. But I am fortunate that they did trust me and they did say, you know, go ahead and build this solution. Go ahead and, you know, let's look at how we would address that if we do need to go remote. And if we plan for it, we don't need it. You know, that, that's okay. Unfortunately, though, we, we did need it. Uh, the other things that worked for us were really just keeping that bar low. Just click the link. Just go to colorado.law slash wolf204 and you'll be in your classroom. So even our most, you know, tech fearing faculty could get into that Zoom room and teach their class and the same, same on the student side. Uh, the other piece that we pushed really hard was documentation inside of my law. Uh, Teresa, Lionel, the entire IT team really put together some fantastic documentation behind this password protected wall. So they're, they're able to talk more freely and share those links without it being public. And then we push training. Uh, we met with faculty several times before we went fully remote. And then uh, the IT team did a lot of one-on-one -on -one trainings with our faculty to really hand them the reins, give them the host control, let them practice breakout rooms, practice screen sharing and, and get that set up. And then we also extended our classroom on call support to uh, the Zoom rooms. We included uh, that so that students and faculty could get immediate help. 
And then again, what works is really just following that physical classroom schedule. We also later offered a dial-in phone option for the bandwidth impaired. You know, a number of our students, we are a somewhat rural state and they don't have the best bandwidth or they're an apartment complex with shared bandwidth and with everybody home on Netflix. They just couldn't use video. Um, and then the ability to really have admin access to these Zoom spaces to pull recordings and log in and assist faculty while they were teaching. But really the best part was probably the the entire faculty, the staff of the law school, and the IT staff's ability to be flexible, really iterative, and have a quick, quick evolution. Uh, so a quick note, uh, we did use Zoom as kind of a poor person's panopto or lecture capture. You know, we would have faculty just go into a Zoom room you know, with nobody else in there and screen share and make recordings uh, for a asynchronous teaching. Uh, we also found video playback can work, provided you've got really good bandwidth, especially upstream, and strong compute power. Uh, those are really important. But yeah, we're, we're able to hold watch parties and movie nights inside of Zoom. So the do-overs, you know, there's, there's a lot I wish I would do over. Um, you know, I wish we had done password enabled right out of the gate. Uh, that broke some bookmarks for our short links. I uh, wish we had done host links earlier, added a dial-in option earlier. Um, like Debbie had mentioned, I wish we had the Opto. And I wish I bought some Zoom stock. Um, that might have made a difference in my bottom line. We're looking to the future. Um, we're refitting our classrooms this summer uh, with cameras and to really be able to integrate Zoom and Panopto into these rooms, providing additional training and really just pushing those advanced features. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're at and that's what our quick journey through Zoom. Uh, happy to take questions after or feel free to email myself or Teresa. But thank you all so much and hope this wasn't too quick, but that's, that's it in a snapshot, thank you. John, we had a bunch of questions in the Q and A. Yeah, you want to you want to try to grab a few of them? Sure. Could you please clarify a little on claiming host? Uh, where would the link actually take the faculty? Uh, so the, the thank you, John. The claim host link would take faculty to a login screen. So if they were logged into their Zoom account, it would take them into the meeting as a host. If they had not yet logged in, they would get the Zoom login screen where they would authenticate with our university's federated identity. Cool. How did you record the classes and separately post them? Uh, so the classes were, uh, we asked the faculty to hit the record button when they were in. And in some cases, we just scheduled and had our text log in to hit record. Uh, we didn't have a lot of cloud storage. So most of that was recorded to the computers. And then we posted to unlisted YouTube and, and put them in Twen uh, or Google Drive uh, for students to access. For looking to fall, that's going to be Panopto. Ah. So there, there, there seems to be ongoing confusion. Now, this, these weren't, this wasn't the hardware Zoom rooms that Zoom Correct. sells. This is, this is just the Zoom, you, you taking Zoom and calling them Zoom rooms. So, so, so there's, a, there's a couple of questions there where people think it's the stuff that, that's a, where, where you're going to have a faculty member teaching and you're going to have people remote. I think Correct. that when we came up with that, I, or when John came up with the name Zoom room, we weren't even aware that there was a product called Zoom room. We just, um, John came up with the idea of just getting an actual Zoom account for each classroom. Yep, totally understand. And going um, forward though, we are getting the hardware codec, uh, which is the technically licensed Zoom room. So yeah, we are moving forward after the fall. Yep. And inevitably a FERPA question, you know. Well, when, wait, when, John, let me interrupt you yet. We're not done with this session. All right, no, I know. Okay. Yeah, okay, because you know, there's still more to go and I wanted to make sure you know, we're saving questions for the end. Yep. All okay. right, all right. Uh, the, the, <laughs> I'm the, just, the, the great sorry. and powerful Elmer has spoken. And so, and so we'll, 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 we'll save that question for the end and, and move on for our last, uh, our, our last uh, presenters. Um, and yeah, course, I just I lost wanna, my uh, place. Jump in and, and clarify uh, our uh, the title of our presentation. Um, we we actually had uh, video clips of Mad Max uh, Beyond Thunderdome with uh, the little sax scene where he meets Anti Entity, uh, and then we had interspersed uh, sax solos from Men at Works, uh, Who Can It Be Now, uh, Rio uh, Rio Duran Duran, and also uh, We Don't Need Another Hero, uh, the Tina Turner song from that movie. So. You're missing out on it, but uh, supposedly, I think uh, Elmer said that it's on the website. So, Tobias, go ahead, folks. Tobias, you can there. It is. Yep.
Is he sharing the video audio? Yeah, do we need sound? Yeah, uh, he's working on it. Yeah, he'll get it. Should we talk about the before times? Yeah, let's talk about the before times. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, let's introduce ourselves. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deb Kinney. I'm uh, part of Media Services, and this is all of Media Services at Duke, the three of us. I'm uh, Jeff Chilcott. I'm the Educational Technologist. And uh, I'm Miguel Bordo. I'm the Media Services Manager. Duke Law. Um, was one of those schools that kind of held out on doing kind of any online um, classes, online education. And um, so we really, I think, came in as, as a law school unprepared for making the transition from the before times of, um, of you know, classroom teaching, Socratic method, and, and um, teaching in the round um, to, to having to do this, what we're doing. Um, of Not only that, but it, it seemed to me when I first got there over a year ago that um, distance education was kind of off the books, wasn't even something to, you know, we had guest speakers come in. I mean, we have how many classrooms? What is it, 13? something like that I mean, uh, yeah something like that yeah. and they're all they're all prepped and ready for for zooms and video conferences and we would occasionally have to bring guest speakers in and we had a few uh, power users that were that were doing using zoom the semester before or I guess in the spring or the fall or the spring uh, before we we left that I remember yeah, I mean, uh, the only other times that I think we did any kind of uh, distance education was uh, when Neil Siegel um, hosted, it was a, um, I don't know, like a six week course with In Judge Ghana. Ghana. And, um, you know, that was really our first foray into it, um, to, to do it consistently. Um, but um, yeah, so, you know, as you guys all know, uh, we at Duke had um, WebEx and Zoom as, as options. But over the last year or so, we were, you know, we had a pilot about a year ago of, of uh, working in Zoom, which we were a part of. Um, and, and Deb was, um, you know, one of those administrators on that as well. Um, and um, it became clear that, that Zoom, um, would be our preference and was really the preference for all of Duke University um, for ease of use and, and um, you know, so we didn't, we didn't have all the answers and I don't think that we really had the type of familiarity that we wanted, but I think we, we were able to kind of um, handle the basics. Sure. Yeah, I think that um, we certainly didn't have all the answers. We had all the options afforded to us as far as um, using Zoom or WebEx or, or whatever it was that the, the faculty wanted to use. But, you know, I think as we got into it, we realized that um, as we started to state that Zoom was the preferred choice, um, that there, there were things about Zoom that I think none of, none of us could have anticipated at that point because the way that we were using it uh, up until that, up until that point was, was for that ease of use um, and, and the security concerns had not come, you know, uh, to a head at that point. So, so it was, you know, very much uh, an issue once we got rolling. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting too that um, when we were starting to think about this, um, it was, and, and when we had discussions kind of with the administration um, and with Wayne, we had, I think, a day or two before spring break was going to start. And I remember that we were all talking as a group about, well, 
once we get into spring break that Monday, what, what are we going to do? And, and, um, and I think uh, initially, I think we had suggested, well, we were just going to do um, three sessions a day um, for, for Zoom and, and have faculty come in uh, during spring break, which, you know, some faculty weren't going to be around. But um, we had to act fast because um, unlike the university, which was pushing the spring break another week, we were actually going to start that Monday after spring break. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't have a whole lot of time. You know, the university had that extra week to kind of get people prepared and um, at least get them, um, you know, familiar enough with, with Zoom. Um, but like, what do you guys remember about that? Well, it seems so long ago. Yeah. yeah. So I think if we step back a second, Duke was really well placed because we had Zoom in place. You know, that year that we had the pilot, we could have easily said, no, Duke isn't going to jump in bed with Zoom and we're going to stick with WebEx. But because we did partner with Zoom, we had that in place so that everyone at the university could had an account. So faculty, staff, and students. So we were really well placed and fortunate that we had that already and that some folks were familiar at least enough to know what Zoom was. And I know probably a lot of schools did not have that um, as a fallback. What about, um, what do you guys um, kind of want to comment on in terms of the, the trial and error uh, for the settings for, for Zoom? I think we all ran into it. Yeah, we sure did. And I think, you know, it's interesting because even though I had familiarity with Zoom being the administrator, for a practical sense in, you know, how you want to set up your entire class, we weren't prepared for that. You know, do you have a waiting room? Do you not? Do you set up your personal meeting room and use that ID? Do you schedule? Um, certainly our faculty didn't <laughs> didn't want to and weren't interested in scheduling the next uh, five weeks of a four-day class. So trying to configure those things were, were certainly challenges. And then when we realized that there was all of this Zoom bombing going on, and isn't our terminology great now? <laughs> we have social distancing and Zoom bombing. Um, but then they came out with all of yeah. these patches and updates to try to make things more secure because that wasn't even part of our, of our mindset. You know, we were more interested in how can we get a faculty to know what a click is and how to, you know, look at their camera or where their camera was or even get a camera. So we had, we had all sorts of challenges. Um, I think one of the things we didn't anticipate was that we would be moving through the material faster than some folks were comfortable. So we, we hadn't thought to uh, initially have different um, levels of, of expertise, like a training for, for a novice or, you know, a beginner and one for a more immediate or intermediate or expert type of person. I think if we could roll it back, we would have done, we would have split those up and uh, maybe even had people come to an initial session and then an intermediate session. Um, one of the things that was nice because we are such a small group was that Maggie and some of the administrators set up um, Zoom meetings for the, for the faculty members to hold in which they could invite other faculty members and then try out some of those, the features within Zoom so they, they knew before they had their first class. We didn't have time to put together a, a thought process on this is the way you approach Zoom. You know, it was, we are now in the fire and what do we do? Um, so the faculty created their own Sakai um, site where they would post uh, helpful hints and tips. Um, I also had access to that. And so whenever we did create a video, um, I would post our videos there. Um, and so it was a kind of a resource page um, with, uh, you know, and 
documentation and, and information on, on using Zoom. And um, it, was, it was also helpful for then the faculty to communicate with themselves about, okay, this is what I've done in my class and, and this is how I was able to do breakout sessions, uh, you know, within the Zoom meeting and, um, or, or polling or whatever. That becomes such a, such a teachable moment for them, uh, not only to learn, learn a teaching tool technological teaching tool, but also to see it from the, not only their perspective, but from the student's perspective. What are the, what are the students looking at when they're coming in? And I think that's, that's really important for them to, to know uh, going into teaching a, a course online is, is how does this look from, from the outside looking in from, from a student's perspective? Um, so hopefully they learn some, some valuable uh, skills during that. I know that moving forward, we're going to have to help them fine tune those skills. So there's probably going to be more Zoom sessions where we're in Sakai and, and some of the other teaching tools trying to, trying to suss some of those, those problems out. I, I think we now are starting to have the conversation of, well, what do we do in the fall? Sure. Let's just say moving forward, I think that it, it should be apparent that, that faculty members need to be able to use these sorts of tools in order to um, teach their courses moving forward in asynchronous manner where they can use them outside of the class, use those uh, tools within Sakai and, and have the students come to have those in-class sessions be a little bit more valuable to them uh, now that they're, they're using both, both sets. I think, I think the important thing to, to realize from this is that you can't really replace the value of an in-class session, but you can enhance it with these tools. And that's what, that's what it's all about. It is, it's gonna be a perpetual learning curve and probably like every institution out there, Duke has you know, hiring freezes and they have spending caps. And so yes, it would be wonderful to have laptops in the hands of all of the faculty so that we know what is on their device, that it's all set up, it's ready to use, but who knows how long it will be before any institution is financially solvent enough to be able to put those things into the hands of the faculty. So we're going to have to cobble together with what we have. So any other kind of thoughts about the before times or, or the after plague and, and all of this Mad Maxing beyond uh, Zoomadrome? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because we, I, I feel like we are kind of in this weird, almost apocalyptic, <laughs> like rebuild. Is the, are, are we experts yet? I mean, are, I mean, but, we feel like we are media services as, as um, academic technologies that we're, I, I would say we're not even complete experts in it. I hate to say that, but you know, there's, there were things that we didn't know going into this pandemic. And I think that, I think there might be a, a misconception that now that I've used Zoom for the last four or five weeks of my class, I am now a Zoom expert. Who knows? I mean, who knows what it's going to look like? Yeah, things will definitely be different. Any, any parting words, Deb? Well, you know, I think... As my background indicates, you know, we are all boldly going where we haven't been before. Um, you know, even if you had some sort of distance learning program, it wasn't your entire law school. And, you know, training the faculty in technology is one thing, but the human element is entirely different. And so I think, you know, patience is definitely going to be key. We're all going to have to um, take a step back and even though we've gotten things in place, you know, in the short term, we're going to have to sort of reformulate what we do in the long term and how we can both help the students and the faculty come to a more normalized approach where we're all getting sort of what we need, but realizing that it's not going to be the same as it was before. Definitely weird and exciting times. Yeah. <laughs> that was great.
Thank you for preparing that. Um, all right. So questions. I'm going to pull one all the way from the bottom because uh, because it's a great sort of like open ended question, um, and it's for all any any of you. How how do you build great IT teams in law schools? What 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 advice do you have for for folks who are working on that? For our team, it really helped that whether we're in the library or IT or AV, we're a small team, we stay in daily communication and we're very willing to give each other admin rights and walk each other through. So Debbie and I were brand new to like the footprint system that's used for IT tickets, but Sajel made sure that her and her team met with us really quick, just a quick video call to be like, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Um, as we're moving into the summer and trying to figure out things like CMS and LMS and what do we do for in the future, we're making sure that all members of our team have equal access as admins in our sandboxes and we can check in with each other as we need to learn and grow together. Because if we aren't focusing on cross training each other and giving each other access, it's just going to add more silos and more roadblocks and none of us need that right now. There's also a lot of transparency on our team. So like, you know, we may disagree on like, well, we should go in that direction. We should go in that direction. And then we just start like laying out the facts till the facts tell us what we're going to do. Cause we are constantly communication it, it, saying like, okay, what about this? What about that? Um, and you know, we have some really great people. People are creative, people are open-minded. Uh, and we all have the idea of, we want the best experience for our faculty, students and staff. And that's what drives, you know, this, team of the four of us, but all the other ones who are working for us, uh, Rosa and Nicole in faculty support, Juan and Rudy in IT, um, the others that are in AV that work for Sue. Um, so, you know, they, that's a core part of our mission and, and we're always keeping that in mind. Yeah, I would yeah, say I'll in, uh, real quick, uh, I think having um, a, a diverse uh, set of folks with, with specific skill sets I mean, we all bring something unique to the table and, and have certain expertise and, and that really has been helpful. Um, and so being a small cohesive group uh, really helps. Jonathan? Yeah, it's really about hiring for people. It's about people who care. It's about the creativity and it is about that diversity. Those are the, the key pieces. The, the tech skills can be trained, but it's that, the desire to solve problems and, and troubleshoot. Emily, I was delighted to hear you use the word cross train. I was, I, uh, it was a big question I had for the dean yesterday. I'm not, you know, uh, where where schools don't have um, an investment in IT or an investment in instructional ed or in ed tech, um, maybe they should look at their at their libraries. Although you know, a thousand library directors just went great, more responsibility, um, um, or they said great, more responsibility because they're willing to take on those things. Speaking of serving faculty, I have to go. I have a meeting with one. <laughs> All right. See you later. And um, to follow on with what John said, um, we're a really small staff as far as university employees. And we have we hire the best student techs that we can find. They don't have to have IT uh, skills. We can train those. They just have to be willing to jump in and um, be proactive and um, willing to help students, faculty, staff, you know, they're really awesome. And uh, we end up hiring some of them as permanent staff because they stay with us for their full three or four years of, batch, of their bachelor's degree. Uh-huh, uh-huh, excellent. Um, um, here's, a, here's a question um, and it's, Beyond the beyond the security for things like Zoom bombing, uh, there's also the security that that FERPA, that that you know student records or student information or student discussions uh, will 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 leak or be shared. Uh, what what if anything can you can you give us uh, can you tell us uh, advise us in, in terms of how you're dealing with that? Well, one thing that we have done is we make sure that um, all of the videos um, that were recorded uh, within Zoom were then um, placed in our LMS Sakai. Um, and in order to access that, you would have to um, log in through NetID. Um, and you can also attach a password to that Zoom recording. So that's a way to double it up. Oh, cool. How do you like Sakai? 
it's great. I mean, we've been using it for six or seven years and Jeff is actually working on a Sakai site now for the faculty to train up the faculty uh, as we move into the fall. Yep, yep. Right, yeah, I think, I think Sakai is nice. I came from uh, Moodle uh, LMS, so um, it's familiar. It's, uh, th they're actually coming up with some updates for next year, so that should be interesting. So we're training them on this current version, and then I think we'll have to do some retraining once that's all said and done at, at some point next year. Excellent. All right, last question. Uh, what rapid professional development tools, uh, products or processes, uh, you, you find the most critical uh, during the summer for to be, to be prepared? I'm not sure what a rapid professional, um, oops, somebody just uh, answered the question and it disappeared. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what, what a pr rapid professional development tool is uh, in, in this particular thing. Um, so, so I understand your, your silence if you don't know how to answer that. Um, all right, there's one more question, why not? Uh, from Sally, uh, do, uh, do you get permissions from the students to be recorded? Which is different, different question than the recording is passworded, yes. Do, do, you, do you, yeah, are there, are there yeah, I'll stop. Yeah, many of our faculty raised this uh, question with their students and I think overwhelmingly the response was the students were, it was acceptable. And where it wasn't, I think they, they worked through that and identified other issues. But yeah, this is a, a challenge and it's definitely a policy we're looking to for fall to address. Yep. yep. Yeah, st a students sign a waiver and um, when, when they come to the university knowing that they can be recorded or, or photographed uh, during, during any class or event. Gotcha. Yeah, or, or, ours do as well, but it, it's definitely a faculty concern because we want to make sure that our students are feeling comfortable in class, especially when they're on video on Zoom and knowing that that is recorded and wasn't recorded before. And for the most part, the classes, the recordings of the classes were only available to people in that class, at least for now. Um, they were, you know, on a direct link with permissions on it. Great. Folks, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I know we gave you the constraint of keeping it down to 15 minutes. I thought it, I thought uh, you pulled it off uh, excellently. Um, everybody, uh, there, it, it's time for another break. We've got nothing planned during this break, so so go do your 100 push-ups and your 100 sit-ups. Um, and in the chat, or uh, tell me if you know what that reference is from. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Stay sanitized. <laughs> Hey, Karid got it right. <laughs>